Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino. This is episode number 146. Uno, cuatro, cies. We're here. Another new episodo. Episodio, whatever you call it in Spanish. Mi nombre es Agostino. Straight from Stratford. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome back. Welcome the fuck back. Happy Monday, motherfuckers. Happy fucking Mondays. I love a good Monday. Um, I love a good start of the week. I love a reset, as I've mentioned umpteen times before. Reset your week. Get things started again. I'm not one to wait for New Year's Eve resolutions. Well, that's all malarkey. But there's something about Monday. There's something about that M. There's something about the beginning of the day, the beginning of the week that just gets me started. You know, it gets me going and being pumped. As you can tell, I'm quite pumped in the morning. Um, I've just got, I've just done like a few sit ups. I think I no oh well sit ups and push ups mostly. I did uh, a set of a hundred push ups. I did probably like a set of thirty sit ups. So I'm feeling quite hyped and ready to go. Um, after work, when I come back, I'm gonna go for a long run, maybe about four to five miles around the block, and do that malarkey. So I'm already looking forward to that. But I'm just looking forward to getting this Monday started, man. I love fucking Mondays. Such a good time, you know. The weekends behind you, all your fun and floral frolicking around has been put to bed and now you are where you are and you're starting again back on that treadmill back on the fucking treadmill oh so good um weekend wise what did i get up to what did i get up to this weekend um a pretty quiet one for the most part as opposed to like um socially right i didn't go out and meet anyone um but i did have quite a busy weekend in terms of djing um, as per usual, DJ on Friday at Tapis from 7 until 11 o'clock which was a pretty good yeah, evening out it's starting to pick up a little bit of steam now, I can tell. Um, I think I mentioned this um, uh, the other day with my uh, fellow DJ colleague, uh, Natalia, also known as Afro Muzo on the flyer. But um, I was talking to her and I, we can feel like it's starting to pick up a little bit. It feels like um, it feels like we've gained the trust of the people that come to that bar or uh, come to that pub and come and hang out after work. And um, I don't take that for granted, man. I'm really kind of happy that we've been able to kind of carve our own little lane and they can tr- they kind of trust our musical choice um, after work on a Friday because, you know, for the most part, I know some of my more cooler hipster friends probably don't do that, like go out to like, you know, shitty bars and pubs or not, let's say quote unquote shitty bars and pubs, especially one in the shopping mall at Westfield, right? after work to get a drink because you know and because what you do if you're cool if you're a cooler person or you're in the scene is that you go to a bar where you're typically going to be around people that are as cool as you or there's a good vibe there or they have a good playlist or you know generally it's a good better ambiance so the likelihood that you're going to have a shitty night out on the friday in your local pub is quite null and void right because you're you know you're killing you're kind of um eliminating any kind of you know any kind of point of contrition by going somewhere where it's fairly quite cool the problem that you have with these bars and clubs that I play at is that it's a flick of a coin, right? Flip of a coin for the most part. You have no idea what you're going to get. You could go to Weatherspoon that's probably have a good vibe, right? For the most part, with the Weatherspoon Hacky Central that I've been to a, a few times with some friends, it's usually a good vibe because Weatherspoon Hacky Central, right? It's got a good mix of like locals and it's got a good mix of hipsters. So it's quite a cool little place to go hang out and get some cheaper pints before you go out and go clubbing and stuff. But if you go to another one, you might go to one where... There's a DJ there playing, you know, fucking god awful like top 100 hits, right? There might be a really shitty band playing. Um, there might be a playlist on that's really crappy and too loud. There are all these variables that are gonna really fuck up your whole night, right? So sometimes, um, the whole going out after work on a Friday can be quite risky, especially if you're not with the group that you kind of like. So, if anything, it's really the responsibility of the bar and usually the person that's playing to make sure that person kind of stays and feels comfortable. So there's a lot of onus, a lot of pressure on us, I think, especially on a Friday after work, to kind of get that right. Even more so in Westford Stratford, because, you know, by and large, you've got like, you know, um, a much broader range of clientele coming into that bar and pub, right? It's not specific to just like locals and hipsters, as like a women's building in Hackney is. It's got, you know, you've got people, you've got tourists coming in there, you've got people that work in the offices around the corner, um, you've got people that are just passing through, people that are waiting for, tra- I've had guys now spoken to who are just waiting for trains, right, waiting for like um, the big like rail trains to take them back to wherever they live outside of London, so you've got all these, all these weird variables that are kind of, you know, all in this kind of small little craft uh, uh, beer spot, right, which is Tapis, that sounds, you know, they've got amazing craft beer there that people you know, travel far and wide to come and sample, 
and then and then you've got the kind of addition of us DJing in the corner. So you kind of have to get that right and make sure it doesn't you don't fuck it up. So there's a lot of pressure on that on that regard. And I remember when we first started, um, it kind of felt like every other day, every weekend that we were playing there, someone was asking some fucking outlandish or crazy suggestion about a, a tune that they wanted to play, right? And again, I'm not against people asking me for requests because I kind of accept that the level that I'm at now is kind of like, you know, open mic level and as a comedian. You're generally going to be playing in, you know, quite, um, you're going to be playing in quite like, um, let's say, um, amateur fields for the most part right you're not gonna be playing in like you know top of the range nightclubs and stuff but you're gonna be starting out you're gonna get given a chance to play in places regularly because you know you don't mind playing for a nominal amount of money um which kind of then brings with it the added annoyance of having people in it that don't necessarily get what a dj is or what it's meant to do right they don't actually get that you know you're meant to just go there and try and understand what the space needs and try and fill this the space up with sounds that are going to complement the space not that you're there as a kind of living embodiment of a jukebox but some people don't get that so i understand right i get that and i'm not that um help i'm not that kind of like uppity on it if someone asks me a request i've got it i'll just play it like it's no big deal it's not it's no skill of my nose no respect but it felt like, you know, every week I was playing there, we were playing there, it felt like the, the, the requests were just getting more erratic. They were just getting way crazy, right? One person won the Fugees. Next minute is fucking Billy Idol. Next minute is Elvis Presley. It just didn't have any sense, right? There was no little flow to it, especially considering what I was playing at the moment. Because if I'm playing like Sean Paul and you ask me for, I don't know, um, oh, name another, I don't know, a Rihanna song, right? Um, that maybe falls in the sort of, same sort of cat- category as a Sean Paul, then fair enough, isn't it? But just asking me something that has nothing to do with what I'm playing kind of got a bit annoying. But I kind of was thinking at the time that, you know what, I think it's because we haven't earned their trust yet. I don't think they trust our ability. They just think like, you know, the moment I play something that I want to play is suddenly I'm going to go into like, you know, hip hop mode or like R&B mode or what, I don't know. Whatever they're thinking when you look at someone DJing, you kind of get the sound, oh, now they're going to play all this shitty stuff, right? You don't really trust them. But I kind of really had the idea behind the the way I went to DJ there. I kind of took inspiration from this club that I never ended up going to. And now it's closed, unfortunately, um, in Dusseldorf called um, Salon de Amateurs, right? They did a really amazing feature on Salon de Amateurs on Resident Advisor, which I recommend you check out. Actually, I'll try I'll make you. Let me try and get it up on here. But it was a really amazing feature that I remember seeing about this club, right? Called Salon de Amateurs. Salon de Amateurs. The uh, resident advisor, right? Resident advisor. Let's get up on here. Bish bash boss. Um, where is it? It's there was a little feature in it. Where was it here? Is it there? Where's the feature? Come on, there we go. Feature. Boom. So this is the club that I kind of had the idea about where I was gonna try and kind of you know frame how I was gonna frame the way I was gonna DJ at Tapis for I like called the tapped so the whole idea behind selling amateurs it was that it was this bar in Dusseldorf right where they kind of you know and again Germany probably are more uh, are more akin to this sort of like you know way of doing things because they just get they just get club culture probably a lot better than other people in other countries right but the whole idea behind selling amateurs was that you had this nightclub in Dusseldorf or this bar this kind of lounge bar in Dusseldorf where they invited locals and friends and family to come and play residents only night for the most part for the you know they had guests on there and it was a real kind of eclectic mix of music like nothing really there was no real rhyme or reason why you would play like an opera song like you know at, at peak hours of the night and people would be standing up on top of the bar hooting and clapping and you know making noise it didn't really make any sense why this was working but it was working at the time right and this really inspired me how i went to craft the way i wanted to play music because i always thought of it in a sense of um this is a feature on the resident advisor i'm kind of scrolling through here on screen but it kind of and then you can see like they you know they've got all these kind of like really hipster people playing at this bar really amazing kind of you know um esoteric kind of djs and then you've got local dice right i love that kind of marriage right and my idea behind the djing playlist of playing at tapis was that i wanted to i wanted it i kind of imagined what i'd like if i'd went out on a friday night right because I don't know, I'm I'm somebody that's like um I'm not against a bit of spontaneity. I don't mind like you know letting the night take me where it wants to take me. So I'd imagine meeting up some friends after I finish my shift in H and M or something, right, or whatever shop I was working in, and then coming down, me and my friend that's working in I don't know um a, sh- a shop downstairs, whatever, maybe or John Lewis, and then saying oh let's grab a beer and then we're gonna go to Dawson later, right? So we go okay, let's just get a beer here and it's craft beer place, right? And you walk into Tapis and you hear this great music playing in the background. And you're like, oh, this is quite cool, actually. And once you finish your first pint and you're mates in the toilet, 
and he pops back out again and another good song comes on and he comes back to the table and he's like, you know what? Should we just stay and get another one? And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, why not? Because you both live in East London, right? You both live around like the Stratford area. What's the point of going away to Dawson and coming back again, um, out out again here to this um, East? You might as well just stay there. So it's the idea of like catching people's attention whilst they're in the, whilst they came somewhere they didn't think they were going to come to. Because obviously, I'm again understanding that being on the open mic level as a DJ, not there's not necessarily people going to come out specifically to see me play. Right, I'm not at that level yet. I don't have a following or anything. People are just going to come to the places that I play at, and if I'm playing there that time and I do a good job, they're going to stay. And if I if they come if they come back another time and I happen to be there again, they're going to say, "Oh, this guy's good." Right, that's where it's going to go from. But it's not going to be like, "Oh wow, I can see I was playing somewhere." No one gives a shit. But what I have in my at my this at my disposal is opportunity to play music in front of people right in this kind of little space and kind of really change their perception of what a dj is and what i can do in my terms of musical taste and that's what has been probably the most entertaining part about playing at tapis at the, at the moment you can see pictures of his son and amateurs like you know just how loungy and relaxed it is people just playing good music this feature is amazing i recommend you check it out um it really kind of opened my eyes in terms of like what it meant to have like maybe a club night or a night in general because obviously coming from the alibi sense of the word or from the alibi scene where it was mostly about you know um it was mostly about you know cultivating a sound maybe promoting a kind of sound aesthetic you wanted to promote out there but also mainly um about you know making sure you had enough people in the in the room to justify the night to pay the djs and to get paid at the end of the night right that was kind of the onus of it there was obviously an opportunity to kind of get people you know new interesting djs in there but most of it was making sure that you covered your nut and you weren't like paying out of pocket for people but this is another way right where you're kind of it's like a bit of a longer burn slower burn you don't get the hype of like okay we're gonna book ricardo Vera lobos first week to play at tap east you have to kind of like hope that you know me and natalia back to back can kind of hold that place down hold it together and because of course like she has pressure on her end because she starts earlier than i do at five which is again probably the peak time people are coming out so you have to hold them there and then i also have the responsibility when she passed the baton to me at seven to make sure that that they don't leave as soon as she leaves right oh this guy's playing now he's shit we hate him do you know what i mean it's that kind of really weird in between gap and i'm seeing a lot of difference i've seen like even in the beginning i even noticed when we were first djing um at tap east whenever i took over from natalia from seven to eight it kind of dropped off. People just like leave straight away, right? Because, you know, generally the music will stop. I might change the tempo and stuff, whatever. Maybe they don't like what I play, whatever it may be, and they'll leave, right? But then, um, and then that also, the time when the, 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 the request increased. But in other time now, I've seen people stay a little longer. I've seen people leave maybe at 10 or sometimes 11. Sometimes now I've seen people hang around. It's not just me playing until 11. And it slowly but surely got better to the point now I hardly get any requests. People just come up to me for the most part and just say, oh yeah, I like that song. Thanks for playing this. Oh, that was amazing. I, I like that you play this thing. And one of the best kind of compliments I got was the other week, actually. Um, We both kind of got the same compliment from this guy who basically said... um that he likes when we play because essentially like we play like you know the general stuff like you know your mum and dad would probably like or you know some general kind of like you know um great it's rolling stones great it's hits magazines kind of songs right but then i also sprinkle in the stuff that i like right i also play some anderson pack i might play some of the internet i might play i don't know a random fucking techno track that i like that kind of fits really well in that kind of environment just really mixing it up and he kind of really appreciate it and again this is something that as a dj you kind of do yourself and you hope people just like it but you don't you don't really think they understand the reasoning behind it but then he kind of articulated it really well so that's been a really interesting kind of like experience um and i saw all this to say all this blabbering to say this about this club night is because now over time so that, that happened on friday then i did it on, on saturday for my night labertees which happened at um the heath cotton star that was fucking awesome as well to play there um um, great because again it's like a you know it's a chain branch of pubs or bars that they own around london they also own the star of bethnal the hackney something was it whatever that one's called they got loads of those kind of star places they've got latent star that was a good night because of course it's you know again it attracts probably a, a bit more of a younger clientele a bit more of a cooler clientele and that kind of part of, of latent stone but also it was good because you know that place has changed management a few times um, in terms of bar managers who kind of, you know, have a, a say in who plays sometimes, who they like, who they want to promote, blah, blah, blah. But oh, oh, across those kind of changes over a space of a year now, it's been that I've kind of been running at night. They've consistently kept me on. They consistently wanted me to be a part of the bar. They've liked what I played. Um, they just liked everything that I do, right? And I've consistently been getting good um, reports and remarks from them. And it's nice because this last Saturday I just passed one of the bartenders that, that works there, one of the girls that works there. It's really nice. Um, it was her birthday. And she was really happy that I was one playing there. She invited some of her friends to come down. 
um, to have a bit of a song and a dance. And yeah, it was really good. It was really good, man. And at the end, so much so, they was like, you know, they were really happy that I was playing along for her birthday and she had a good time. And it was amazing just to get that kind of response, you know. And again, um, this kind of DJing luck has been something that I've always been interested to do, something I've always liked to do as a hobby, something that I've kind of always felt like I had a bit of a voice. I had something different to say, something different to um, to kind of um, showcase right behind the booth. I always find it interesting. I always find it cool that I would blow people's minds, right? For the most part, with the stuff that I play, because looking at me, they'd expect one thing and then I'd play another thing. At first, it was something that kind of annoyed me, but then I kind of thought it was a bit of my, it was my superpower, the ability to kind of traverse these different worlds and kind of be able to meld and blend them into one DJ set. And this has been something that I've been really happy and pleased about I've been able to do. Um, the only challenge I've been able to have kind of face is that I'm trying to illustrate somehow how I can capture what I play in a nightclub on an online mix, right? I've not been kind of be able to transcend that so far for the most part, but it's something that I kind of need to kind of curate and get better. Um, it might have to be something that I kind of do in the same sense of how the Fabric Live mix CDs were. Remember those, right? Where they were kind of usually like a, a way of the DJ kind of showcasing what really works for them when they play at Fabric, like their ultimate kind of like, you know, party um, mixtape that might be a way to do it. instead of just recording a set that I do in a nightclub because it doesn't really have any context I don't know that was something to work with it but off the back of that good response um, one of the former managers of the Heathcote and Star reached out to me the other week and asked me to play at the Free Compasses in Dawson which again is an interesting way to kind of you know um, punctuate the story of my whole journey through you know um, being one of the kind of main cool guys in Dawson and hanging around that scene to kind of falling out of favor due to my own kind of inability to adapt and also due to kind of other things outside of my control and then kind of like deciding I wanted to DJ in Stratford and Leightonstone in this area only which is you know at the time that I was doing it three or four years ago no one was DJing there was no real bars I needed to DJ at because you know there's no equipment to do it you have to bring all your own stuff I didn't have my own stuff so it wasn't really set up for it, but I kind of persevered, kept sending fucking email after email after email, getting no response from people. Um, suddenly kind of got this opportunity and now it all comes back around full circle and I'm back DJing now at Dawson, um, which is fucking weird and blowing me the fuck away. But all this to say, um, I guess, because I've, I've said this a few times to myself and other people, sometimes I don't follow my own advice, but sometimes I do, you know, we're, net, we're, we're humans in that regard. The key to all this, I think, is trying to, do the best job that you can do regardless of opportunity you get given, right? Regardless of how shitty it may be, regardless of how small and insignificant it may be, no matter how nominal the fee is, do your best, right? Bring your best. Do your best. Because I really believe, like, how you do one thing is how you do everything. I honestly believe that. You know sometimes when you're in a bit of a predicament and you're a bit stressed out and you're feeling a little bit, um, what do you call it? Um, How did you say? You're just feeling, you know, you're just feeling like you can't really get started, Sometimes you might do this thing. I know I do sometimes. You start cleaning the house. You start cleaning the kitchen. You start cleaning some plates. You start organizing your wardrobe. You start organizing your bookshelf, right? You do these weird little things, right? These little rituals that you do. Why do you do that? It's, so it's your way. It's a kind of like um, unconscious way of your mind trying to get some things in order in order to allow you to think. Because you're like, okay, cool. If I can get my bookshelf in order, then it's going to allow me to think better. Because that bookshelf is like a, is like a living reputation of how muddled or how fucked up or how like confused my brain is at the moment but if i can get that sorted everything else will work out the same way and that's how i think it is to do jobs in general right i think the way you approach that one tiny thing that you're doing if you've been asked just to kind of like i don't know stand at the fucking door how you approach the standing at the door is going to affect everything else that you do coming back to it because if you think oh standing the door is beneath me i shouldn't be doing this i'm hiding this what should i be doing this waste of time that is obviously going to permeate other things that you end up doing in the end. It's just something that I truly believe. In. I don't. It's kind of like um, um, working out, having a good diet. One can't offset the other. You can't outwork a bad diet, right? You can't like you know. You can't outwork a bad work ethic in general. You have to be able to have that work ethic on all planes. And the better way to do it, I think, is to start at the lowest plane. When you when when I'm playing in places that are charging you, um, that are giving you fifty pounds um, to play somewhere, right? The way that I approach that, the fact that I sit down the whole week and research place and research the place I'm playing at, watch video clips uploaded onto Instagram of people that have been there, listen to the kind of stuff people like there, look at the nights that people have been throwing there previously, get a vibe of what's going on there. Maybe you go in there at the bar incognito and hope no one recognizes me so I can just, or not recognize me, but like the bar manager recognizes me just to get a feel of what people are playing in there. I'll do all these things and prepare playlists just for like a 50 pound fee. 
that is going to then um, be the same work ethic that I have when I eventually go and play in a really famous nightclub somewhere or I go and tour or whatever it may be, right? That is going to be the same level of preparation. I'm not going to just wing it because I've been doing, because that same um, work ethic has allowed me these opportunities. Why would I then suddenly stop? But then if you start doing, if you start practicing bad habits from the, from the beginning, it's very hard to kind of turn it around. And, you know, and obviously it helps, you know, to be like a person that people like to be around, right? I generally, I'm quite hospitable i kind of do go into this kind of with a bit more of a professional attitude more so than i might have done in the past when i was hanging around dawson and stuff i was a bit more of a party boy a bit more of a you know trying to be a man about town which is again purposely done right i was purposely trying to be like you know um, a mainstay in the scene i wanted people to know that i'm the one i'm one of the pe people behind this night i'm one of the people that does this right that was kind of my image so mostly that was an image thing right it wasn't necessarily a skill thing right so you're kind of selling yourself by being crazy and being outlandish so which kind of you know is good because you know at that time everyone else is being crazy and outlandish and is drunk and drugged up so it fits but in this environment where i'm kind of providing a service i'm kind of coming in like an independent contractor and doing a job you have to be quite professional about it right you can't be a dick yeah you have to kind of you know treat the space you're working in with respect and the people that work there respect and i think that's kind of again aided me and helped me again in this kind of essence where people are kind of reaching out to me over email saying oh actually we like you as a person right and we want to get you back in again because they, they they just know i'm not going to be in any trouble i'm not that demanding you know I, I come in i do my job and i kind of leave right i don't overstay my welcome like just kind of little tiny things that i've kind of done that i've kind of understood as time has kind of progressed and yeah and i'm just happy with how it's kind of unfolded out again it's not it's not that i was waiting for these positive re reaffirmations i wasn't waiting for um to be proven right with my approach but i did believe that you know I did believe that in order for me to kind of achieve my goals and get where I need to get to the DJing thing, that I kind of need to do things differently. I kind of didn't need to kind of follow the general path that's been laid out by everyone else, what everyone else is kind of doing now, where it's just consistently, you know, everyone's kind of doing the same routine, doing club nights around Dawson, getting an online radio show on fucking NTS or all those kind of places, uh, doing a boiler room. Like there's kind of paths that people always do, right? That kind of, the you know, or um, DJing during fashion week, doing a launch part, doing a store launch, launch event a capsule launch event djing in the corner these kind of things they think that is going to be the route to get them a look in the industry but in my opinion doing i want to do it the kind of like actual dj way it's a bit more harder work it's a bit more grassroots you have to kind of get involved in the mud you have to go and dj at really kind of like unknown places where no one's going to be at where you're going to be playing for a crowd of five people and shit if that right for the most part um with a sound system that kind of just about works right you're going to be playing at that sort of lower level and you're going to be eating shit for a long, 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 long time until you get to where you want to get to. It's a longer journey, but the fruits of it, I think, are far more worthwhile. Um, for me personally, again, it's just what depends what you want. If you want to be the kind of cool gal or guy around town, then there is something that you have. There is There are things you have to do. And, you know, we all know these people who, who, who are amazing on social media kind of get all the kind of amazing brand deals, do the kind of store launch events. They're, that's a particular kind of breed that you kind of, and actions, your actions need to match up to that kind of ambition, right? You need to be around places, you need to be buying outfits, you need to be kind of putting yourself front and center, all things, making sure everything's getting captured and recorded. Like there's a certain thing that have to be done. And that's just something I wasn't really, um, what I didn't want to do for myself. That wasn't my goal. Um, again, if you want to do that thing, there are other answers to follow, but I think if you want to do the other thing and you want to be, you know, a DJ that's kind of, cause I want to be doing this when I'm in my sixties and seventies, man, just playing music for people, right. In different places, different spaces. That's just amazing. Cause it, it allows you to travel the world, see new things. Like I just want to be doing this as like, just as fun. And if you get paid for it, it's fucking awesome. Right. So if you want to be doing this in your, you know, in your latter years, in new and interesting places, you want to be rubbing shoulders with some of the most important or influential DJs and producers of our time, being able to play in some of the best designed spaces that ever existed, working with great sound engineers, with great promoters, with better with great bar managers there's a way to do it that really involves a lot of slow burn a lot of kind of grafting at the bottom you're scraping away and then eventually you'll get to where you need to get to but it takes a lot of kind of like humility i think maybe swallowing your ego a lot of patience and just a lot maybe a lot of foresight because like i said like living in london there is a kind of it seems like there is a kind of a bit of a blueprint that everyone kind of follows um which is a bit of annoying because everyone kind of does the same thing but for the most part i think following that blueprint you're just going to end up in a crowd full of people 
you know, like just everyone's kind of doing the same thing. That kind of like, you know, cool hipster DJ person exists everywhere and they're very good at it. It's not something that I kind of want to do. And again, it's just too much traffic there. I think there's less traffic on the other side because obviously it's a bit more of a longer journey and requires a lot more patience. But in the end, I think it's worthwhile because now look, right? It's all come back full circle, right? I got kind of like, quote unquote, kicked out of the Dawson scene, which I didn't really because I left. But imagine on paper, it was, oh, he's not, you know, whatever around anymore. What people want to say, but now I'm kind of being invited back in, like, you know, at, as and I'm getting paid to come back in, which is fucking awesome, right? Which is the best thing possible in this situation. So yeah, happy about that. Happy has kind of happened full circle. Um, I haven't got a, a name for the night yet. What I want to do, I think I might just have it just hands on black man presents or just you know just have it as my name as free compasses. I'm not gonna call it a night anymore. Probably might change up a little bit. Um, but I'm playing on the first of February from nine till twelve thirty at the free compasses in Dawson and then the the February the eighth as well. So back to back um weekends. Um the first of February at the uh, at the free compasses in Dawson and the eighth of February at the free compasses in Dawson. So check that out. Um listings are gonna be on my website at xnozingo.com under DJ gigs you'll see the listings on there and hopefully a flyer will be coming up in the next couple of weeks or next couple of days or so. Just decide exactly where I wanna how I want to position it. But yeah, I'm happy about that man. It's fucking awesome how things have all come back around full circle on that regard um what else so let's get into some topics because you know i've been rambling a lot about my dj thing about too much um so talking about djing stuff um uh, this is always a really interesting article about um dry january affecting bars and clubs um all over the uk which makes a lot of sense um I think as a lot of people have probably attested, I think for me it's been an interesting journey. I think something that I've kind of been surprised how mature I've been with this. But I think ever since the whole DJing thing has kind of kicked off a little bit more in the last couple of years for me, um, especially since I've been doing it in a more professional way in terms of like DJing in bars and clubs I mentioned before, um, and you know, and just kind of working my way up that way, I've kind of started doing less um extra curricular stuff whether it be drugs or alcohol than i did previously right um and most of it is you because of most of it is because you know when i'm djing somewhere it's really annoying how much better i am sober right and i say annoying because anyone that's been to a bar or a club or a pub with mates and they're not drinking you know how annoying it is sitting there with your friends who are hammered and they're repeating the same thing seven times um they're touching you a lot like you're in a space where everyone's really sloppy and you know about to fall over and shit it's just an annoying atmosphere to be in when you're incredibly sober because you know essentially you're not really in the in the flow what everyone else is doing around you and of course your friends kind of immediately feel that tension and they kind of keep asking you questions you know whether or not you want to drink or are you all right and that's getting in your nerves it's just a, it's just a, it's just a, there's a lot of friction happening in that space but um, I've noticed in that space because I'm DJing it's obviously easy because I'm not communicating with people I'm just behind this booth or behind the table so there's that kind of distance behind it but also I've noticed that my DJing is a lot better because I have the clarity of thought right I can kind of feel things like that same tension I feel when I feel people are drunk I can also feel what they might kind of want if they want to kind of sit down and chill I can kind of get it around me so that kind of works you know for its negative and for its positive but I'm also aware that by and large i have seen a difference in how people are approaching drinking and going out and i've kind of seen a bit of a you know there is where where, where you see an upsurge in social media of people promoting health and wellness you're definitely going to affect you know the kind of going out economy right because maybe which is why which is probably what explains um partly what the success of people's finstagram is right um the finstagram that people have um on instagram is basically a second account where you get to upload anything and everything that you want onto social, onto Instagram without um, being conscious or being, you know, caring too much about what the picture looks like or what it even, even is promoting. Um, some of my friends that have Instagram use that as mainly as a, an account to just post up, post all their kind of, you know, um, escapades when they're going out. Yeah, how hammered they are, what they're drinking, what they're doing, who they are, where they're at, where they're at, what after party they went to, just loads of nightlife debauchery sort of stuff, right? Um, whereas your main Instagram profile might be promoting fucking dumbbell workouts, kettlebell swings, avocado toast, um, you know, taking walks, going to take modern. It might be really wholesome, but then your Instagram is kind of you know a bit crazy and reckless. So obviously, with that that might p partly explain why there's kind of been a bit of a you know decline in the whole drinking thing in january but by and large anyway with the whole health and fitness thing um 
I'm not surprised this will happen. I'm not surprised that some bars and clubs will be affected by that. They see that kind of dip. I've not really seen that kind of notion happen. I've not really seen that kind of thing being reflected in the gym I go to. I've not really seen an upsurge of people coming since January started. I think people kind of, you know, especially in my borough, my area, I don't think people really care about New Year's Eve for the most part. But maybe in more like, you know, um, health conscious, younger places, maybe there might be a bit of an upsurge. But I haven't really seen that thing happen. But I have seen a little, I have seen when I've walked, past especially at night time coming back from my dj sets and stuff i have seen a kind of a le- um less people around outside in bars and pubs it just feels like it's a bit more empty like by and large and that really could really be down to um people just being a bit more conscious about their health and stuff right and this article on the bbc kind of explains it um quite succinctly a bit better than i am now um, and it's called um, Can Bar- Can Pubs uh, Stand Many More Dry Januaries? Um, it says here, um, in January, people are naturally recovering from um, overindulgence of Christmas um, and have less cash to splurge on nice dinners, bottles of wine and going out. But um, faced with an extra challenge over the first few years, dry January. The charity campaign, which encourages people to stop drinking for alcohol um, for the month, began in 2013 only, which is fucking crazy. Um when just 5,000 people took part, by an estimate 4.2 Brit- uh, Britons said that they would participate this year, which is kind of a bit of um, an extension, or maybe that's where Sober October probably came in. Well, that was mostly uh, due to Joe Rogan and those kind of guys. But that's something I've always kind of done. I, I remember that was one of the things I first did when I kind of thought I had, my, I had a problem with alcohol. Um, when I was kind of, again, during my kind of heydays of going out in Dawson and promoting nights around Shoreditch and Dawson area, um, I used to kind of go out all the time from like Thursday to Sunday, sometimes like Wednesday to Sunday, right? All the time, every single week of our fail. How I had the mind to do that and buy clothes and do whatever, I'd not, I had no idea. Don't ask me that. Um, but I somehow continued to do it. And I was, and I remember thinking I was kind of getting a bit off the rails, kind of going a bit crazy. I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do dry January. And this I might have decided to do this, I don't know, in October, November. And at the time I was working for this online fashion store place. And suddenly I was kind of asked to go, or we had to kind of request it to go to a trade show event in Berlin in June, January, right? So we spent kind of like most of the kind of, you know, big part of January in Berlin for this trade show event with a few other colleagues I was working with at the time. And we went to loads of industry parties. We've done all this sort of thing. And it was during the time that I decided I'm going to do dry January. So I decided before and I said I was going to stick with it. And we went there. We went to all these brand parties. We went to an Adidas party where they're promoting the NMD where Kano fucking performed, right? In this amazing warehouse space. And they basically had an open bar that was free for everyone to drink from. And so they had a bar, like a normal bar you order drinks from. And then on one side of the wall, I kid you not, they had like, I don't know, four fridges full of Carlsberg, like the little tiny, like 200, I don't know, I think a 175 lit- millimeter, those kind of little tiny Cronenberg bottle things that you get. It was full of fucking Cronenberg, fr- like four fridges. And I must've been standing there thinking, fucking hell, my luck, right? I decided to do dry January. And the moment I do it is like the moment I go to Berlin, right? One of the best cities in the world to go drink, right? And club and get up to any sort of nonsense. I go to an Adidas NMD launch party where one of my favorite MCs of all time, Kano, is performing. And they have a free bar. Like, and and an overabundance of beer available for you to pour from the fridge. Like, just insane. But i'm sure other other people have the same story right whenever you decide to do something and go abstain from something all of a sudden all the all the parties all the events pop up from shit right um but when i did that i kind of really quickly figured out oh i don't have a problem because not and not at one time did i feel like i was missing out on anything like oh my god i wish i was drunk at this event because i enjoyed the event i went to uh, i saw kena performing in berlin um it was a good time i mean i had fun like I had fun in Berlin with my colleagues. We went to a trade show. We made contacts. We got the thing up and running. Everything went as it should go. Um, so I didn't really feel like I was missing out on anything. Um, and that's when I suddenly thought, oh, I don't need this to have fun. I don't need this. Like I, This is not a problem. This is not like an addiction for me. Uh, where some people, you know, might need alcohol to just to function, just to get out of bed. They might need a swig of vodka or whatever it may, or whatever it may be, right? But I didn't actually need that. I actually only, it felt like I did it in terms, I kind of did the alcohol thing or got drunk for the most part to kind of increase my um, um, personality, to kind of uh, maximize my volume, which is fucking crazy considering how loud I am anyway. But that's kind of where my thinking can be in it. But I wasn't, I wasn't dependent on alcohol. Um, and I remember that being kind of like, again, a bit of an... Uh, and not was an outsider, but I, I remember it when I said to the people that I was doing it, it was a bit of a weird fringe. You feel like, oh my God, what you're doing? So, you're, you're doing dry January. That's fucking crazy, right? 
But I think as the years has progressed, I've kind of seen more and people adopt it. So it's kind of been, again, as the numbers of tests, it's kind of, you know, the millions, it's going to the millions now. And I just think it's, especially in, in England, with how shit we are with um, drinking culture in general, right? The fact that, you know, most of, you know, there's a higher rate of alcoholism in, in the UK for the most part. Most of it, you know, is kind of like, you know, isolated maybe to like smaller towns and places where people don't have that much to do or the, the job opportunities aren't that great. But most partly it's also due to our kind of draconian drinking and licensing laws that, you know, force bars and clubs to close at ridiculously early times, which then encourage people to kind of drink really early in the day, which kind of then encourages the bars to kind of um, give out, you know, insane deals in order to kind of get more people in the bar to make more returns on the bar and just kind of it kind of raises the it, it raises the tempo of how quickly people drink here right because we have a really short window um effectively we all have to drink alcohol before 12 a.m right and then we all get chucked out into the streets and be told to fend for ourselves whereas in other countries where drinking cultures are a bit more relaxed you know you can start at any time of the day because it ends later on in the day right berlin there's an abundance of places not even clubs just regular bars hole in the walls that open until 4 a.m so there's no real need to kind of rush the way you drink. So I think even though Dry January is a bit cliche, it's a bit cringy, I think it's important to have people just have a month, 31 days where they just kind of like take time off and just don't drink and just kind of get, because again, with it coming off the back of Christmas and work parties are always a bit crazy. And even towards the end of the year, people are bringing in drinks. So you're offering, you know, everyone's kind of, there's usually a birthday. There's usually a birthday every other week between the months of the month of August and fucking December anyway. Um, so that can kind of, kind of, kind of get a bit, you know, a bit too much for your liver and stuff. So it's good to give yourself a bit of a break. And I'm kind of a big fan of it. And again, like I said, it's annoying reading this article for people that are owning a bar and stuff and working in that industry because, you know, if actually your business is kind of failing because of it. But I think overall, by and large, I think it's a good thing for the general health and prosperity of the nation. Um, the article continues. That this is kind of a bit that kind of hit home to me, kind of the the, the thing that's happening here. Um, this bar owner says, um, imagine that each um, of these people would normally spend, say, £25 a week on alcohol. Um, we don't we don't have to do that in maths um, to show you how much money the hospitality industry is set to miss out on. So imagine uh, all those people that are doing generally spend £25 a week now suddenly not coming to the bar. Not like, not. like It's not that they're abstaining, because again, that's what I'm saying. I think maybe health promotion or, you know, um, alcoholic alcoholism prevention might be a little bit better for the bar industry because, you know, it might tell people, hey, instead of having five pints, have two, right? Or when you feel tipsy, stop, right? That kind of stuff. But when people are completely abstaining and not coming, that must hurt bars and clubs like no end. Um, it says here, according to a 2018 study by the University of Sussex conducted with over 800 dry January participants, 88% said that they had saved money, 7% had generally improved health, and 6% said they find more energy. Moreover, the benefits lasted long beyond January participants saying that they were still drinking less in August, which is as I found true too. Uh, dry January was one of those weird things. I'm not sure if it's maybe it's better i don't know why it works better than diets um maybe because sometimes in, when it comes to diets people don't actually diet well or they diet, diet properly they don't really follow the rules they kind of you know take some twists and turns here and there but i did find when i did the dry january even though i just did it specifically to make sure i didn't have a problem with alcohol i did find when i started drinking again that i was drinking less it was still maybe a lot than most people would drink but it was less than what i was drinking previously and then of course over time over the period of years and whatever it may be you slowly but surely come to a point where you stop drinking as much as you did in the past and now because i dj every weekend and i have effectively a free drink voucher whenever i go to any sort of pub that i play in i tend to drink less regardless because you know i'm going to be drinking on a friday and a saturday um i've also done implemented a kind of rule in my house where i kind of don't buy any alcohol um, um, to have at home, right? For the most part, if I want to, if I want to have a drink, I have to go out and get a drink, which kind of again limits the amount of alcohol I'm drinking. Um, I don't really have a big social group of friends that I kind of hang out with. For the most part, any kind of person I'm going to hang out with is probably going to be a work kind of colleague, which is gonna it's kind of rare um, here. And for the most part, anyway, I don't necessarily tend to hang out with people from work that often. So my chances of kind of you know going into a bar all the time are quite limited for the most part most of the reasons why i'm going to be in a bar is the is, is the kind of you know rare occasions that i meet up with a friend um the times that i go out clubbing to go see a dj or the times that i'm djing myself those are only three occasions that are going to happen and, and you know one one what happens every week uh the clubbing thing happens whenever i want to see someone play and the hanging out with a friend is whenever we decide to go hang out so it kind of limits my occasions i don't have any birthdays i don't have any work events i'm not 
I don't need a drink to kind of de-stress and shit, right? Like, so loads of things kind of work in my favor in that regard. But I think overall, the DJing thing has really helped me, which is kind of strange to say. It really has helped me to kind of limit my drinking and kind of go on. But I think in general, I do promote the whole dry January thing. I think people should abstain from anything, whether it's kind of, you know, chocolate, whether it's your smartphone, whether, whatever it may be. I think there should be a kind of, you should have parameters set up where you're not overly dependent on anything, right? So you don't get addicted to things too easily. And again, I think as most people, I don't know, everyone always says, I've got a very addictive personality, but I think we all have addictive personalities. We can all pick up kind of new habits quite quickly and start implementing in our lives and finding, you know, all of a sudden we've craved, we've craved, we've carved out like a a portion of our day that's solely kind of concentrated on that kind of one thing that didn't exist previously before in the past. Um, And I think the way to break that is, you know, by kind of putting it in a kind of is box right like this is my smartphone box i have this time to look at my smartphone i have this time to drink i mean put it in boxes um i think that probably is the best way to do it because all that kind of like one drink a day thing doesn't work because you know no one's drinking a drink a day that's not happening right if you want to drink one you're gonna drink seven um like i said with me i just don't buy alcohol at home um i only um have to when i have to get a drink i have to go outside um I DJ every weekend, so again, that means I'm, I'm going to have a drink when I'm at a bar, at least one, so that kind of limits it and kind of makes my mind feel, okay, cool, if I have one on Monday, then I'm going to have one on Tuesday, I mean, that means kind of seven, it's not going to work, so I'd rather have the Monday to, or the Sunday to to Thursday kind of solid and not have any drinks, and then from Thursday to Saturday when I'm kind of DJing or whatever, out and about, that can kind of be a time when I'm kind of um, on the alcohol tip, but for the most part, dry January has kind of worked and benefited me quite often or quite quite a lot in my life especially uh sober october that i do later in the year um that is it for that one um on the whole alcohol front um next up here um burger complaints oh burger to clubbing culture this is a little thread i saw on reddit on the subreddit um techno uh, i'm not sure if people actually do people actually look, use reddit i don't know if people i don't know if reddit is still one of those things that people are kind of ashamed that they kind of use or they kind of peruse a lot. I don't know. It's kind of got that bit of a stigma towards it. I'm not sure why that is. Um, I love Reddit. I use it all the time. I use the hip-hop um, subreddit. I go on the soccer one for football stuff. There's a, a subreddit for, um, you know, every podcast imaginable that you might listen to. There's one for Red Devils, right? The one that I kind of, um, my my football team, sorry, that I kind of support, Man United. They've got a good subreddit there. Um, and just in general, right? from stuff like SpaceX and Tesla stuff, like just a good place to kind of, you know, get an aggregate, you know, as I say, it's a front page of the internet. So I love to use it all the time. But it was an interesting um, thread that popped up the other day um, regarding Bergheim that kind of, again, got me thinking about, you know, the whole DJing thing. Maybe this podcast is a bit more electronic music DJ kind of focused. So apologies for those that don't care about this sort of stuff. But it kind of got me thinking about, you know, just the, the bigger goal sometimes, you know, so how how some decisions can affect people individually and it's kind of painful and it's annoying and it hurts your feelings. But then it's kind of like a bigger purpose to it that you kind of have to kind of, you know, accept in a weird way. And it happened in other cases too, but it kind of just got me thinking about this. So there's this thread on, on Reddit, um, this user kind of writ on there, um, and it's titled, I'm going to get up on here. It's titled, uh, went to Berkheim, was super disappointed and won't go back, right? So it's a thread I saw on Reddit and it reads as follows. Personally, I think Berkheim is a really lame club. The whole vibe of the club is totally fake. It just seems like everyone there is dressed and acting the way they do to conform to the arbitrary rules set by the door guy, not because that's how they actually are. I got rejected last week with a group of two friends, acting and dressing like my normal self. So I did some internet research, then came back alone with a, with all black clothes, a dog collar around my neck and a stupid black cape I brought from a fancy dress shop. I felt like an absolute idiot, but it worked and I got in. The club itself was pretty disappointing. I've clubbed a lot of places around the world and it was definitely nothing special and not even better than other nightclubs in Berlin. I felt like the entire reputation of the place is just created by difficulty of getting in. I stayed for a few hours, then left and went to another club without a stupid door policy where I could invite my friends and not have to wonder if they could even be allowed in. Why would you want to go somewhere with a guy at the door going nine or ya and deciding people's um, fates uh, in a scene reminiscent of the in- entry to a concentration camp? The techno scene is supposed to be about accepting people, not rejecting people. This It really pisses me off to hear that people's nights were ruined because of what a doorman at a nightclub thought of their outfit. Or hear them elated because they made it past like something that trivial should affect their ego i get the feeling of talking to people in berlin that the reason they say that they had a great time there is just because their ego got boost and they felt exclusive when they got let in um forward slash rant sorry just needed to get it out of my head 
um, too long didn't read Ber- Turgan. Bergan is totally overrated. Now, of course, this person has their, you know, you have a right to say what you want to say about the Bergheim, and I kind of understand the sentiment, even though it kind of started off as an attack straight away, right? Personally, I feel like Bergheim um, is really lame club, right? You, you can't, you don't, you're not really going to get a succinct point or nuanced point starting off that way. But, you know, again, personal experience, I kind of do understand where that person's coming from. I get it, right? You go to a play, especially a nightclub. I think for the most part, clubbing culture, especially... Well, yeah, cabin culture by and large, anyway, um, especially in the last few years, has basically been, you know, um, if you have the money, you can come in, right? That's what most nightclubs are like, right? Um, and I guess Bergheim or the Berlin scene in general is a bit of a, sh- it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of a mind fuck because it's probably the one place in the world where most places don't just let you in if you have the money, especially the places that you want to go to, right? Um, some of the places you don't even know about because they're not on the internet they're kind of all kept hush hush um, by locals or people in the know the places that you do want to go to on the internet are really tight and aware of who they want to let in because they don't want to damage or ruin the place that everyone's talking about on the internet so there's this weird kind of balance that they found where the only way to kind of really get it right is to make sure that the door picking from the front is what sets the tone on the inside it's kind of get that get that thing started off in the front the front is the main thing as long as you let the people that you let in are right the vibe inside is going to be right because you're you're aware you have the best djs playing in there you're aware you got the best sound system like that's by and large going to happen you're aware you got the best spaces right some of the most interesting club spaces in general right to party can be found in in berlin as a city so you know you've got that right but the other thing is a variable that you really can't control people you let in so the only way to do it is by selecting and sometimes it can be annoying you know you can kind of remind you of kind of the 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 um, one of the reasons why kind of studio 54 kind of went downhill after watching the documentary that came out recently i recommend you check it out was by and large due to the fact that the the owner of the studio 55 tied a lot of his ego around who he selected to come in right he went to be a celebrity himself and he finally had a space where he kind of can be the main man the velvet robe idea came from that and the idea of like denying people and letting other people come in uh, built up resentment in the local scene, right? It started off as this kind of escape for people in the LGBTQ or gay community to kind of come and release themselves from a society that wasn't really accepting of who they are, or what their sexuality was. And they can kind of finally be in a safe space where they can kind of celebrate each other and music in this amazing environment. Then it kind of transcended and kind of went into pop culture and then celebrities wanted to come and get involved because, again, it was a place where people could be free and be themselves without the kind of um, feeling they were kind of being watched by an all-seeing public. Um, and then, of course, naturally, the kind of, you know, general consumer on the street suffered because of that because, you know, they were promoting celebrities and that was all kind of going to the forefront. And it kind of built resentment, right? Because if you're queuing up, especially seeing pictures of... It's had, it has footage in the in the 254 documentary that came out a while back, uh, a few more, well, maybe a few months ago. You should check it out. But there's footage of of 254 during its heyday, with you know uh, a fucking crowd of people at the front door, not even a queue, because you know they, they didn't have really have good queue management at that time, or in general just got a bit too crazy. And literally celebrities jumping out of cars and shouting across the crowd at the bar and to kind of let them in, right? And then and then they're being escorted and kind of weed through the crowd that have been waiting outside the door for like three or seven, three or four hours, right? And then, of course, that can build resentment and you can kind of think, you know what, fuck this place. And respectively, that's what happened, right? And that kind of coincided with the kind of um, uh, Disco Sucks movement and then, by, and, you know, and so but surely mismanagement of funds and, you know, the whole controversy that happened with 54 with those guys embezzling the money and it closed. But kind of the, the domino effect was the fact that they kind of, you know, um, took the selecting process um, to places where it should never go, where it kind of, you know, um, prioritized celebrities over the general public and it kind of, you know, um, kind of built resentment of people on the outside. But Berkheim has done a really good way, has done a really best way by kind of the core of the kind of reason why it's around is because, you know, it's a safe haven for the gay community that um are kind of reason why electronic music is where it is, especially in that kind of city, right? So they try and keep that core, right? That fetish gay scene that kind of is the reason why it's so weird and people always talk about a dark room stumbling in there. Do you know what I mean that the, the the things that kind of make you in awe of the space and make you appreciate this thing exist is what they've kind of been trying to keep intact, right? They're trying to be holding desperately. There's been fucking Conan went to fucking Bergkind and tried to do that whole sketch show there. There's been umpteen videos made about it of how to get in. It's all over pop culture, right? It's all over mainstream media. But somehow they've still remained this, they still kind of kept this kind of underground ethos about the Bergkind, right? And the reason, only way to do that is flexing at the front door. 
Now, trying to get in is obviously, of course, difficult. I'm not going to say it isn't. Um, but once you do get in, you realise why it's so difficult to get in because the space itself is probably a, one of the, if not one of the best club designs you've probably ever seen, right? An amazing factory that they've kind of converted into this um, hallowed church sort of kind of building on the inside with an amazing uh, sound system, especially Berghain in the main room, Panorama Bar probably may not, not so much because of how the layout is. But for the most part, from the toilets, how they're designed with the, with the fucking metal, sh the heavy metal sheet doors and the beam, the like little LED light beam on the side, like everything about it is just insane. So by the time you get in there, you realize what all the hype is about because um, audios, um, your audio sensitivity and all that sort of malarkey, you just, it just tingles walking in there, right? Hearing the fucking do, 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 do as you're handing in your coat downstairs, walking around, seeing the massive statue, walking up the stairs. It's just, it's just insane. Everything, all your senses get blown away. And again, like I said, when, when you're the person that gets turned away, it's annoying. But I think I've been to the Bergheim a lot of times now. And I think by and large, the people that are getting in know they're going to get in. The people that don't get in are not that surprised for the most part. And it's not that difficult to to kind of get in there, especially on your own, especially maybe with smaller groups, people who kind of get it. And I think sometimes, I don't maybe agree with the whole idea this guy says about, you know, having to change yourself to get into a place. But I think, you know, going to a nice restaurant, going to see somebody at a the theatre or whatever, or hanging out with a friend, or even when you go to your your parents' house to go have Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner, whatever it may be, you get a little bit dressed up, right? You put on your best outfit. I don't know, you, you, you want to put your best foot forward. And there is a kind of idea behind it, especially in clubbing culture, where there is clubbing gear, right? You kind of see that a lot when you go to those kind of places like Berkheim or you go to places in Berlin where you forget that ravers still exist. People that specifically go out to rave and, ha and showcase a new outfit that they put together. And there is something special about that because that's where kind of clubbing culture came from, right? Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with kind of going out and getting a new outfit to go to a certain place that you kind of want to feel accepted in and kind of feel part of. I don't think there's, any, there's nothing worse than going to a place where somebody clearly shouldn't be there, right? In terms of like, you know, just in general, it kind of throws off the whole entire vibe. And again, I think that pickiness about it, because uh, I, I can't imagine the amount of people they must turn away there, the amount of people that must come through the door on a week, on a weekend basis. I think it's w warranted. Um, because once again, once you get in, you realize it straight away. And again, I think of all the big clubs in the world, right? You get, you get, you basically get to pay 18 euros to stay in a club if you want to for three days, right? Because Bergen's open from like Friday all the way to Sunday, right? You can stay in that club all day or early Monday. You can stay in that club all weekend for 18 euros. And on any given weekend, the lineup is just absolutely insane, right? Any DJ you name that you kind of want to see is going to be playing in that space, right? Let's take a look quickly on the website so I can attest this. I'm pretty sure. Like, it's just like an insane kind of lineup of places. So this is for 18 euros, right? So we've got here, uh, uh, this is all January. So let's see, um, yeah, in this weekend coming up. So on Thursday, right? Let me get this up on the screen. Um, so last, so this, this Friday just gone, they had a visitor called Meaning. They had... Daniel B Baldelli and Fran Scala, who I really like. Um, then on Saturday, they had Laura Carbone, Lucy Kruger, right? On Saturday, they had um, Jim Mustafa, uh, Cassie, Tiaja T. Sa Sunday, they had Jerry Williams and Rotten Fisher. Um, this weekend, they're going to have Blackberry, Sophia Portrait, Anastasia Christensen. Zito back to back with Cancella, which can be fucking cool. And back to back at NDRX, the day meant like just insane, insane like venue to go to. And if you go scroll backwards, right, to um let's say fucking December, right? Let's go back to there. Cause sometimes, you know, it's good to kind of see what happened in the past. Can I go there? Let's see if it kind of lets me to do that. Da, da, da. The New Year's Eve lineup was even fucking better than that, right? So you got December. So imagine this is again. This is what I'm saying. Sometimes the, all that nonsense is kind of worth it sometimes just because of the lineups they have. 18 euros, right, for the whole picking stuff. Let's look at the lineup for this. Uh, so let's say imagine you popped into. Let's say you went you went to Berlin for Friday, right, for New Year's Eve. On Friday you'd have peaches. Uh, you have Julian Expo, you have Mesh, you have Zlur. On Sunday, you'd have Niwa, you have Ben Clark, Dax J, uh, The Advent, you have Avalon Emerson, Edward, uh, Fort Remue, Hannah Holland. Like, insane lineup. 
Not to mention everyone else you might get in January. This is again New Year's Eve. Let's see here. 19. Let's go zero one. And then yeah. And then I just I don't know. I, I just muscle deep in every, I just think in general, like I think all the kind of hype and the rigmarole behind it is kind of worth it. I know it's annoying for people that don't get in, and I've no because I've been with mates that haven't got in before. I've I've talked to other friends I've been to Berlin, haven't got in and had and did that whole big uh, Facebook post complaining about it and I've kind of defended the Bergheim. I get it, it's annoying, but I think Berlin's again one of those rare, rare places where if you don't get in on the Bergheim, again I wouldn't really frame my whole holiday around going there. I think like having it as a one of the places you want to go visit during the weekend or whenever week you go there is cool. Um that's really um up to you in that regard. But I wouldn't rather frame my whole holiday behind it in terms of like you know because I wouldn't want to frame holo- my whole holiday around anything in case it flopped and have other things to do. But I think Berlin's one of those weird places like maybe it's similar to London where even if you don't get in to Berkheim there's plenty of other clubs you can go to a stone throwaway like CC Foss and all these other places that will gladly probably let you in and um, if Berkheim doesn't that are equally as good there's no kind of you know there's no delineation between like the, you know there might be you know the top tier one but for the most part the level just below that all the clubs are kind of in the same sort of bracket so it's a kind of one place where you can go to where your night isn't ruined by not getting into one place but I think also the fact that they select at doors is one of the main reasons why the clubbing culture has existed for so long and why it's one of the main tourist attractions people go and visit when they go to places like Berlin which is why the reason why one of the place reasons why our club culture in London has kind of suffered mainly because of the licensing laws of course clubs have to close early but there isn't that kind of care and attention taken to who kind of is allowed into your space right everyone's allowed in you can use your phone everyone's recording everything like people's flashes are going off left right and center and it kind of takes away from people being inside in the moment for the most part and those things are kind of something that i kind of hope that we could kind of do but we kind of don't maybe fold in any place that does that maybe fabric in some respects in a way as well but again i expect i and i respect the guy's complaints i understand where he's coming from but i think by and large um the idea of the Bergheim, the idea of door selection, the idea of taping people's phones, cameras up and making sure people kind of concentrate, having a good time and are in the moment and kind of accept um, um, or respect people's privacy in that environment. Um, you know, I've been in the Berg kind of seen plenty of celebrities that I wouldn't mention on here um, getting up to all sorts of whatever that they're getting up to and having the time of their life. And there's, there's something, your heart smiles when you see somebody that you know on TV or in media just going crazy tops off dancing having a good time because you know by and large in their everyday life they can't necessarily do that they haven't got a space that they can go to where they can stay their own right they're a public figure right they're they're quote-unquote public property everyone kind of feels that they have a right to um take up their time or talk shit to them and it doesn't happen in the world and for the most part if i've seen someone famous people are actually coming up to them as fans and telling them how much they like them without a picture right which probably says a lot more than about their relationship than the picture would because the picture is kind of like a cheat way to kind of get a bit of clout on social media but for the most part they're like really saying hey i really like you i think you're a really good person i mean like there's a lot of love coming from there um and yeah i i i just think that all that trouble, all that pickiness is worth it in the end because it's benefiting so many people, right? I know some people don't get let in, but for the most part, by and large, the people that do get let in are being allowed the platform and an arena to kind of really just be themselves um, for one night, two nights, or three nights only. And I think that's um, that's something that's really commendable, um, I think, especially nowadays where people are so prone to like taking something that's working and just fucking with it, right? Just because they want to fuck with it or they want to make their own stamp. I think it's just something really commendable about that club being exactly how it was when it first launched. Now, generally, the ethos behind it, right? It's still the same thing. It hasn't really lost its magic. It's still the same place you go into. You're like, wow, man, this place is fucking awesome. And um, yeah, I'm just thankful that I've been given the opportunity to kind of, you know, to kind of be around when it's still around, right? To kind of go, have the means to go there and to be lucky enough to get in. Um, the times I haven't got in, I've been bummed, but it hasn't ruined my holiday. I've got just gone somewhere else, but I do understand and respect their decisions and how they go about things. And I hope in general, with more education and more kind of experience going around, because again, we've all, we've all lived in places where, or we've all been to places where it was once good and it, was, and it went to shit rarely rarely if ever the place that goes to shit turns it back around it doesn't happen no matter how many banners they put up of like under new management or whatever it may be no way that was once good and uh, that turns to shit turns it back around it just never happens so it's really it's something really precious when it's good you have it's your responsibility to do everything in your power just to keep it that way right and not fuck up not fuck around with it 
And the way to do it is by keeping these kind of rules and regulations they have around it. And I think by and large, the rules and regulations only exist at the front of the door. Once you go in, I think apart from the don't take drugs on the dance floor, but for the most part, it's lawless in there. You can do whatever you want. All the rules and regulations only exist on the outside to make sure the right people are getting in. And once you get inside, do what the fuck you want. That's amazing. I just think there's nothing, there's nothing better than that, I think, in my opinion. Um, yeah, that's basically my opinion on that whole um, debacle. What else here? Oh, um, not all, because it's not really all news, but um, something that I saw mentioned on the Half Card podcast that I thought might be of interest. Again, not of interest in terms of the news itself, but just in general about what happens next with this whole uh, council um, culture. Not, I won't say council culture, but yeah, maybe council culture in, in some respects. Um, what hap- what's the kind of evolution of it? What happens next, right? What's council culture 2.0? Because I think by and large... I'm in the minority with saying this. I think by and large, it's probably done more good than bad, right? I think even the people that have got like, you know, um, unfairly treated who have been kind of like, you know, um, um, who have been undeserving victims of some of the things that are happening, um, who might have been kind of, you know, labeled wrongly, who might have been misinterpreted the wrong way or whatever it may happen. I think by and large, probably done more good than bad because I think the kind of, if the kind of premise of, you know, council culture was that, which a lot of people have kind of a te- kind of attributed to Donald Trump's grab you by the pussy remark was that there's been things happening that have happened right um, that can't necessarily be proven in a court of law, and the person kind of gets away with it right whether they're a celebrity or somebody in the in the media whatever it may be right and it happens in everyday life too right you can't, it's hard to kind of really prove these points of sexual assault if especially if it's like a he said she said story right no witnesses whatever it's kind of hard to really prove and pin down and what's the appropriate punishment that it's a bit murky so i guess the only way to kind of really attack someone's reputation to kind of really get at them is to attack them online because people have a particular people have a persona right that they put online on social media spaces where which they're very um cognitive of or aware of and they take a lot of time and attention making sure people you know they're represented in the right way so if you're a social justice warrior or you're somebody that's from the me too movement or you're a female in general that's an activist i think it makes sense that one of the things you're going to be really hard on and really be pushing people for is counseling culture right is making sure people that are doing these things that they've been accused of are getting vilified and getting dragged all over social media because that's the only punishment that they can get for the most part right and if they happen to lose their job it's a benefit too because you, you can't put them in prison and in, 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 i'm talking for the mindset of the person that agrees with it solely right i kind of agree with the premise but i don't agree with maybe the whole you know the um, the kind of lack of humanity that's involved in kind of the approach sometimes but i kind of get the general idea of like you know look it's been going on too long no one gets punished i'm going to find them now we've got the chance to punish somebody and attack their reputation on social which for some people is is there everything and be on end all and if we ruin them on there then maybe we'll teach other people a lesson they won't dare to do that again no problem but i think now the evolution of cancel culture is maybe the nuances that involved in it right so say for instance you're you know this story that came up um solo four five right uh member of boy better know someone has been a you know a very close to skepta and kind of in a come up during that scene coming up right with the whole crew i think he spent a bit of time in jail when they were kind of blowing and then came back out again so he's kind of been somebody that's kind of been a fixture of the boy better know shows if you've been to any sort of performances you've probably seen him coming out of his top of big beard you know doing his whole solo 45 re- um, routine so uh, the evolution of this is that if you're somebody that's so fully five and you've been af- accused of um these kind of heinous kind of sexual assault charges right allegedly that he kind of committed the evolution I'm talking about is that what happens next because now we've seen counter culture can counsel someone like Sir 45, right? Everyone can kind of put him in a bad boy bin, kind of get him the fuck out of here, no problem. But then now his friends and associates are kind of receiving a bit of the collateral damage, right? Because people are now calling out Skepta, they're calling out Jamie, they're telling people to kind of make statements and to kind of denounce him and to kind of, you know, chastise him in public, right? And um, there's a, not a lot of nuanced conversations happening within that. Um, moment right because i think the the solo 45 thing you can kind of put to one bug and say okay allegedly this guy did some sick shit he's out right allegedly raped i don't know this what 22 counts of rape um the story is a bit weird and fucking convoluted loads of things happen that people are saying happened and didn't happen it's i don't know what to believe if it's like really aggressive freaky sex games gone 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 a bit awry or whether it's kind of this guy kind of preying on um impressionable women and kind of you know making them do things they didn't want to do under duress who knows right this all allegedly happened but the thing that's really interesting in me is what happens after because you know to to, to chastise solo is one thing but then to say 
Skepta kind of has the responsibility to come up and say something is also another because the nuance is that that's his friend, right? And I think sometimes people are underestimating what friendship means to some people. And to some people, friendship means that regardless of what that person does, they're always going to be their friend. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that because, I, again, I have a different point of view because I don't necessarily have that many friends. So I don't necessarily hold friendship up in, I don't hold friendship up in that high of a pedestal. But I know there's some people out there who will do anything and everything for their friends, right? My, well, my little brother being one of the main examples, I kind of tease him about all the time, right? He's always on the phone to his friends, texting, calling, giggling away on, on, on PS4 where they're playing online and shit. He, everything is about his friends. He, he'll do anything for his friends, literally anything, right? Which is understandable, right? Because, you no, know, I've mentioned it a few times that sometimes in life we get, you know, you get born into a shitty family, right? And, you know, you get told that your family is everything um, and you can't really choose your family. So you kind of have to love them until death do you part, right? Um, you just have no choice. So then sometimes I think those kind of people, when you're growing in the shitty family, you don't necessarily have the people that you want to speak to in your family, right, that you like. I think the way to replace that, the way to kind of construct your own little social group is to kind of make sure you get friends, right? Go out there, find friends. And then when you find friends that you kind of vibe with, you kind of get you, hold on to for dear life because, you know, by and large, it's hard to find people that you kind of get along with. So even if though Solo might have done some really heinous crimes, it's understandable that Skepta being his mate might not want to come out publicly and say anything because that's his friend, right? He's gonna go be he's, he's gonna do it behind closed doors, probably they might have a conversation, whatever it may be, and that's something they're gonna have to do. But that's something that they've done already, or whatever. But I don't think he has a responsibility to say anything publicly because that's his friend. That's not like a friendship that is, you know, available to everyone else. A friendship between those two men. Um, which is fine. And and it's really unfair too to get chastised skeptic just because somebody in his group did something fucked up. Because I remember Again, I, I tried to Google this story, but I couldn't find it. But I remember ages ago when I was, used to live at home, I remember watching this episode of Crime Watch. I stopped watching it because it used to give me nightmares. And again, it's just not a good thing to look forward to. I remember I used to look forward to coming back home and watching Crime Watch. And it was like, you know, it was just like a an hour of just everyone's misery and despair on show for our entertainment, reenacted, right, with really good acting sometimes. Just It was just weird how we all kind of, as a culture, decided to get around the TV and watch Crime Watch, right? It was a strange um, phenomenon that happened during that, those Hannah heydays. But I remember one episode of Crime Watch where there was this group of kids um, that robbed, uh, that did a house robbery, right, somewhere. I don't know, I'm sure if it was London, wherever it was in the UK. So these kids go do a home robbery. They go and break into this person's home. They steal loads of shit. But during the robbery, I think they get kind of spooked and they run out, right? But one of the kids st stays in the house and he goes upstairs. And the kids didn't know that someone was inside. There was an old woman sleeping upstairs, right? But no one knew because, you know, they, they just assumed everyone was out. So the kid that went upstairs, he went he went through her drawers, robbed some shit. And as a woman was sleeping, he sexually assaulted her, right? I'm pretty sure he raped her, right? In her sleep. Um, But none of the other kids in the group knew about what happened. So I think... The police kind of, I think the woman was, the old lady was kind of reluctant to, to say what happened sexual assault wise. But then the police weren't getting anywhere with the house robbery stuff. No one was coming through, no witnesses. So when she finally broke down and, com and confessed and said what happened, the, you know, the part two, what happened, the kind of horrible thing that happened upstairs in, in her bedroom, um, the police thought it would be a good idea to kind of put it out there on Crown Watch because they were, they, were, they were pretty certain that none of the friends in the group knew that they had such a wrong in their group. They didn't know that there was such a fucking, you know, vile creature within their midst that wasn't just going into people's houses and only stealing their, their material possessions, but was also going in there and, you know, sexually assaulting them, violating, violating them physically, right? And once that story came out, immediately that kid got kind of snitched on by his friends because obviously no one wanted to be associated with this guy that was doing such crazy things. So I do think sometimes in groups of friends, they can exist a group, somebody that you know in your group of friends that's doing something on the sly that you have no idea about, right? Whether it's cheating on their long-term partner, whether it's um, a, they're a fucking a thief or some shit, whether they're just a really crappy person to their work colleagues, but they're really nice to their friends. You know, you've met those people before, right? That are fucking dickheads to you at work. And then you meet, the, and then you see them with their, with their friends and you're like, wow, you have actual friends. So I must mean you're either not a dickhead to your friends or your friends accept your dickheadness. It's one thing or the other, right? It's kind of always freaky to see that. So I'm not surprised that, you know, there might be somebody in Skepta's group that is doing some crazy shit, right? And he doesn't know about it. it that, does, that, that can happen. But I also do think there is sometimes we, we all have a little pers personal morality bar, right? 
where there are things that some people can do that are immediately going to excommunicate them from a group and something people that do that won't, you know, that won't. Some people might be lying. Some people might be stealing. Whatever it may be, some people might be um, um, lack of timekeeping, right? The person that's always late, like more than an hour late to meeting you and shit. That might be somebody like, you know what? I've had enough of this. I'm not going to be your friend anymore. But it doesn't really happen that often, right? You don't really break up with your friends. It just, the relationship might deteriorate over time. For instance, if Solo 45 ends up, ends up going back into prison again for a long period of time and doesn't have any communication with your friends, then if, the friendship might just end organically. But also, I won't be surprised if, like, you know, the friends decide to kind of rally around him and say, "His guy's got an actual problem. Let's try and help him out. Because they're his friends. They have that, they have that responsibility and that connection to do that. I think us as normal, everyday public, we can cancel him. We can say what we want and get him the fuck out of here. No problem, because we don't know the guy. But I don't think it's fair to kind of judge Skepta and all those guys the same way we would judge our own personal opinion on how that person acted because we don't have any context. We don't know the person. There's no personal relationship, so we can't... It, it, it's like the parents... It's like the parents of kids that get stabbed in London, right? Um, during gang warfare or gang things, right? Very rarely do you hear a parent say, oh yeah, the kid was involved in crime and shit, right? Admit that. They always say that, no, that kid was perfect. They didn't do anything wrong. They weren't involved in any sort of gang. When by and large, right, for the most part, it's very rare that a kid gets like stabbed or involved in a form of, um, you know, extreme gang violence that isn't about that life as well. It's very rare to happen. It doesn't really happen to like random passerby kids who are just playing football in a cage, right? They usually are involved some way, somehow in it. But again, that person being their mother isn't going to necessarily see the bad. They're only going to see the good because that's their kid, right? Same with friends. You're not necessarily going to see the heinous thing or the amount of lives this guy might have destroyed in the background, right? You're just going to see the, the friend that you go out and hang out with, rightly or wrongly, whoever it is. And like I said before, I'm interested to see how this conversation with um, cancel culture, Me Too, and all this stuff evolves. What's the 2.0 of it? Because there's going to be a lot of nuance that happens where it won't be just enough that the person that does the crime gets punished. People want to see their friends punished too because they're gonna be under this false assumption or this narrative where how could you not know where it's really easy not to know it's really easy not to know that your friend has financial troubles it's really easy to know that your that your friend's parents um are involved in a, um, a violent relationship it's really easy for people to kind of compartmentalize their life because essentially that's where cancel culture comes from right um we can't punish you in the courts we're going to punish your public persona it's again it's a pub it's a social media public it's a social media persona right that's what they want to punish and they know that that affects your kind of you know um your how you feel about yourself on the outside too in the, in the real world but you compartmentalize your life right so uh, I, i'm i'm sure there's people out there who have friends that you have absolutely no idea what's happening in their family home because they don't want you to know so it's not it's not without it's, it's crazy to kind of suggest that, you know, Skepta should have known or hasn't responded to say anything as well in public. And also, why should he say something in public? I also don't see how that helps anything. I don't think there's anything he can say that's going to make what Solo allegedly did right. Um, or it's going to make the situation any better. There's nothing he can really actually say. So sometimes it's better not to say nothing. But sometimes, you know, in this day the days we live in now... Um, being silent and saying nothing you're all make you complicit right um and again like if he gets punished and he goes into prison it should just be over then shouldn't it we should just move on but that isn't going to happen right we kind of seen it similar things happen with asap Bari in his whole situation right um you get punished by the court of law um you know whatever fine you get or whatever punishment you get whatever people decide it's not fair or not fair like should you be able to move on with your life um should your friends still have to suffer because of something that you did um again it puts responsibility back on the person that did the crime to make sure you don't do that because you know that's that's one of the things that people always say a lot people that do crimes right or go into prison they don't they don't in the moment of the act that they're doing they don't actually understand the um, the collateral damage is going to cause right you go into prison for a carjacking you're not you don't understand how that's going to affect your relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend, how it's going to affect your siblings seeing you in prison, how it's going to affect your parents, um, your work opportunities. Like it's got, there's so many, there's so much debris that happens off the back of just that one silly act of like getting into a car and fucking, you know, hotboxing it. How much more so for a, a sexual assault, which is already one of the kind of, you know, one of the number one things in any society that people would automatically kind of throw you out of the village for. Um, so I'm interested to see how that conversation evolves. Where, where, where does it ha where does it evolve to? Where does it go to? Like, because now at the moment, like chastising people's friends that do crazy shit is not something I think is constructive, or is going to be something that's going to get us anywhere to kind of suddenly get to a point where you know we can kind of 
um, people can kind of be held accountable for the actions. I don't necessarily think going for the friends is kind of a good way to kind of go around it. But again, I could be wrong. I could be right. Who bloody knows? But that's something I've kind of thought looking at the whole Solo 45 story. Um, but you know what? I think that's an hour, isn't it? Oh, no, you know what? Maybe one, maybe a couple more. Um, and that kind of lends on briefly to Erica Badu defending R. Kelly, right? This is a fucking... Um, wild story just because you know it, the headline is kind of wild but again it's the nuance right i think in this day and age the nuance doesn't exist we don't have nuance anymore Every, it's just black or white right um um cancelled not cancelled and um erica badu for some reason i'm not sure why um she thought it was a good idea to go on stage and defend r kelly now i don't think i'm not saying r kelly shouldn't be defended by the people that he holds near and dear right maybe there are some people in his life that feel that they should be defending him fair play but i just think nowadays i think now with what's kind of happening in culture i just think it's not worth even comp talking about in terms of the defending point of view because there's nothing that you're going to say um that's going to be um received well enough in order for you to in order for you to kind of put up with the backlash you're going to get so erica badu um recently was on in a concert right um so this article was on the independent i'll quickly read it and see you and kind of go through some of the details. So, singer Eric Badu left fans in shock after reportedly defending R. Kelly during a concert last night. Badu was performing at the Argonne Ballroom in Chicago, where, according to attendees, she criticized. So, in his own city, right? So, imagine um, it's already bad enough, right, for Chicago natives that are fans of R. Kelly. And then this documentary comes up. You get all these women detailing these incredibly um, detailed, heavy stories from various people all across, you know, a various period of time. You know, so it's like too many witnesses. Too much time has passed. We've seen evidence of you doing some crazy shit. We've heard stories of you doing some crazy shit. Everything kind of looks like you probably are um, guilty of what you've been accused of. So it's even worse for Chicago natives because you know, this guy that's like a Chicago icon is like now being, you know, um, dragged all over social media. Um, there's people out there that are still defending him as fans are obviously looking a bit nuts. And on the back of it, you've got Erica Badu performing in your own city and she's still on the stage defending this guy. So I get the optics are a bit fucked up, but let's see um, how else this transpired. So it says here she's performing. And according to one concert goer, Badu said, what if one peop What if one of the people who was assaulted by R. Kelly becomes an offender? Who are we going to crucify then too? Um, another claimed on Twitter that she said that she told the crowd to keep their opinion, to keep their opinions to themselves. Right? Earlier this month, the documentary produced a... Da -da um she defending his actions what if once um she critically posted a photo on instagram featured having eyes that you can see all points of view as a blessing and a curse in the court of public opinion which is true right there is some there is some truth to it right having like i've been accused of that sometimes in my i've been accused of that as well when i was in school but i think nowadays i think it's my special power i was i was accused of always seeing the the good in everything like seeing the other side like being able to you know again argue both points but i think you know, with the R. Kelly story, there is a lot of layers to it that I won't necessarily get into because, again, you're just going to open up a whole different can of worms that don't need to be opened up, right? But um, if there, if people believe hurt people hurt people, right? And if that's true, look at R. Kelly's story. He did suffer some sexual assault issues when he was younger, maybe even towards his teenage years that kind of shaped the person that he was now. And that's not to excuse anything that he'd done, but, you know, there are there are kind of research out there that kind of shows that people who then go on to do sexual, who then go on to commit sexual assault crimes were assaulted themselves in the, in the past. That shouldn't excuse what you do, but add some context to what, the, what where that heinous act come from. It didn't just come suddenly out of the blue, right? There are kind of patterns that kind of lead up to it, right? Um, same with people that are in abusive or assaulting, assault-based kind of relationships, assault-based. Imagine that your relationship is based on assault. But um, that happens a lot, right? So if that happens, there are people out there that are going to have sympathy with it, right? That kind of understand that point of view. Not everyone's going to understand it, and you shouldn't. I don't think everyone should be see the two sides of the story. Some people should just kind of go with what they see with their eye or what they feel in their gut and make a decision about it. No problem. But for those of you that want to think about things a bit deeply or a little bit more nuanced or whatever, I mean, I'll use that word seven million times really in this sentence, but um, that maybe is a point to make, but maybe not in a setting like where she was, right? A concert in chicago just a few weeks after the documentary airs probably isn't the right time to speak about it maybe in the, in the erica Badu's defense she might say it's actually the right time while it's still fresh in the air but i just don't think erica badu especially with how like you know esoteric and um you know woo woo she is um, in general i don't think she maybe has the uh i wouldn't say the verbal because she you know she's one of the best songwriters out there but maybe she just doesn't have the 
she isn't able to articulate what she means right right because this again needs it's kind of when Kanye went on his whole rant about you know all black people shouldn't be democrats and oh well, that's chance rapper but you know so few people you know that whole Kanye thing with the whole you know we're hanging around Kenneth Owens and you know champion Trump he just didn't have the command he just doesn't have the command of the English language um, in order to kind of articulate his point in succinctly enough, right? Or just have all the information, doesn't ha- hasn't researched well enough, hasn't read enough books, hasn't been exposed to what's been currently going on in order to kind of make a really reasoned and well-balanced point, right? Because someone like Jordan Peterson, who's kind of, you know, one of our foremost uh, public intellectuals out there, he gets consistently pillared in so- on, on media, right? For things that he said that people take out of context or twist and turn. And he's very precise with his language. He's somebody that's, I've kind of always kind of, looked at into where he kind of uses the english language right he's very precise in what he says and what he doesn't say and still people make construe what he says so imagine for a fucking musician right you get paid to perform songs and write imaz- amazing songs and all that stuff and perform on stage your talent isn't necessarily being able to synthesize the thoughts of a nation into a salient point on stage that's not necessarily what people come to see you for so it's, it's you know it makes sense that you would go up there and kind of fumble and kind of you know say something that kind of can be misconstrued the wrong way by and large which it says isn't probably that bad but i just think it's maybe not the right time it's probably a little bit insensitive to say it now why it's so fresh in people's memory um i think then again there needs to be a little bit more time and space for that conversation to happen maybe when r kelly is kind of punished in a court of law or whatever happens um that might be the chance then to kind of maybe speak about it after that kind of decision gets made but now whilst everyone just wants to kind of cancel him and whilst everyone's coming to grips with how complicit they might have been in, in kind of covering up what how kind of happened, now probably isn't the right time to say what she probably said. And, you know, and I don't know. And by and large, I just don't think everything that happens in media necessarily warrants your opinion or warrants your point of view. Not everyone wants to hear, which is kind of ironic coming from me talking on a fucking podcast for hours on end. I just I don't necessarily think everything needs a commentary from somebody like some things are just better off left unsaid right just is what it is i don't do that nonsense i don't have any i hope i don't have any friends in my circle that do that kind of thing i don't hang around people that do that kind of thing and that's it right you just kind of like you don't need to constantly be talking about it and saying how horrible something is because we know we're very aware that you know doing the things that R. kelly did are is wrong there's no need to kind of like go out there and kind of say it again or there's no need to kind of say oh maybe he did it because he was hurt too and what if it just doesn't need to be said right now it's not your time or place to kind of say it and again i just think maybe as well erica badu probably isn't a good example of it because you know she's in her own world but maybe just this era we live in this kind of current climate where everyone kind of wants to be the center of attention um it kind of unconsciously makes people want to just talk and say stuff and then they're not saying the right thing because they don't really necessarily thought through what they said. They just want to have their opinion out there. It's kind of like um, a worse extension of, you know, documentation, right? Where pictures and stuff, especially when I used to take pictures back in the day of my Blackberry, upload them onto Flickr, upload them onto my Facebook albums. That was a part, that was a way of me kind of um, um, archiving everything that happened in my life, right? Because obviously, when I was younger, um, not having that much money growing up in my family, we didn't necessarily have cameras and shit hanging around. That was when I grew up as well in the I don't know late '90s, whatever it may be. Digital cameras weren't where they are now; they weren't as cheap. So I'd less, I don't necessarily have any pictures of myself, and I didn't really have a phone with a camera until really late in my kind of teenage life. Um, I don't really have any pictures of myself from like I don't know the ages of like 11 to maybe 18. There's not that many pictures of me that exist on the internet, or just in general. So one of the reasons why I took those pictures was kind of like you know have. Uh, evidence of what I got up to when I was younger it's just nice to kind of look back on nostalgic wise right um, and I think sometimes the whole opinion thing saying what you want to say on this topic is maybe a horrible extension of that where you kind of want to you kind of want to look back on time and see what you said when that thing happened but I think sometimes with the benefit of time and the benefit of evidence and the benefit of um, going through the judicial system when you look back on what happened or you look back on what was accepted back in the day and you look at what your opinion was on that on that moment of time you might cringe you might be like oh, I wish I never said that because things are changing so rapidly right society is changing now what we're getting offended by is changing what we deem as acceptable not acceptable is changing so to kind of firmly put your stake in the ground and say hey man like you know whatever she said you know like um, we can st- um, I can see both sides all this sort of stuff is fucking nuts it's, it's nuts it's, and it's just it's just not worth the aggro that's the only thing just not worth the aggro like the booing people are booing on stage like what people are gonna start cancelling Erica Badu now what like it's just not all that all the kind of the byproduct of that opinion is just not worth 
the, the you standing your ground and saying what you want to say especially when no one's asked you right when, when you get asked maybe it's like you know responsibility not to kind of shirk away from the opportunity or not to shirk away from your um duty to kind of say your work say your piece or whatever duty you think you, you misplaced duty you might have but i think by and large there is kind of there, there needs to be a kind of realization that maybe sometimes saying nothing is better than saying something in my opinion again uh, ironic coming from me because i've been rambling all the time but that's just what i think um i think that's a good place to end it we're about one hour in already um just over that uh that was episode number 146 of the excellence english show um a little bit heavy i think in general i might lighten it up um later on in the week apologies for that but these are just things i've been thinking over the weekend um thanks again for tuning in it's been amazing um as always thanks for tuning in and give and lending your earlobes to moi on this hallowed day um for the rest of you guys start mondays the week look look forward to it you know do the best you can do with the time you have available. We're still in January, by the way. You know, we haven't hit the 31st yet. So all those kind of news resolutions that you were on that you kind of broke, jump back on the wagon again, man. You've got plenty of time, right? Build these good habits now and then you can kind of take you into February. You never know. Um, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode of the Zinger Show. For all links regarding myself, blog entries, um, DJ gigs that I'll be doing that I mentioned previously in the beginning, check out my website, excellentzinger.com. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can click the link in the show description to get one free book credit and a 30-day free trial. Um, all that revenue helps me just to buy more books. So thanks for everyone that's been clicking that link. It's much, much appreciated. And for everyone else watching on YouTube, and all, that, all that malarkey, subscribe, like, share with all your friends. And um, let me know what you think, man. And I'll see you guys again on the other side for another episode of the Axel Zinger Show. Peace.